Hello and welcome to the Palooza Presents podcast for the week of September 26th, 2022. This is episode number 202, and the title of this week's episode and the title of our post of the week is The Pet Relationship Life Cycle. Now, what do I mean by the pet relationship life cycle? Well, I've noticed in my commentary on work and life that there is a function or a step in young relationships because I have pay attention to young relationships as they develop. That's part of the life component of work and life. The concept of relationships and relationships has changed over time. I commented earlier in one of my earlier shows about how it used to be date, get married, then have kids, then buy a house, and how that's changed. And now it's date, buy a house, maybe maybe get married, maybe have kids first. So those steps are skewed. But one of the new steps, at least in my opinion, one of the steps of this cohabitation element is getting a pet. And it's almost like there's a life cycle to it. There is the getting the pet, dealing with the pet issues, Let's face it, a pet is, as many people have said in the past, a trial child. And because of that, care of that living creature and all of the elements related to that living creature exist in our relationships or in our young people's relationships. And this may have been going on for some time because I know that I went through it when I was younger, and that was 25 years ago. So the pet relationship life cycle, I think, is a thing. And that's what today's commentary is all about. Maybe you had a pet when you were younger, and this will ring a bell. Maybe you didn't when you were in an early relationship, or maybe you're just now getting into your early relationships, and you're having that conversation about pets, and about should we get a dog or should we get a cat. And I think that this tale, at least the opening part of my commentary here today is definitely a cautionary tale about what can happen to couples when they go through the pet relationship life cycle. And of course, you can hear that cautionary tale in our post of the week. The Pet Relationship Life Cycle Is the pet relationship life cycle unavoidable? That was the thought that went through my head again and again as I was sitting there on the Lazy Boy at my friend's house. I was at Joe and Amy's place. They were a young couple, just past the modern-day status symbol phase of moving in together. They had decided to get a new puppy. This I knew because they were a younger couple, And that means that every single thought that goes through their head has to be posted in some way on social media. The problem with social media is that it's a stream, not really a billboard. So I missed what happened after they got the puppy. That ignorance was rectified when I went over to visit with them and heard the story. And boy, what a story it was. The dog, a German shepherd named Brownie, was bought from a breeder. A day after they got the dog home, they realized something was wrong with it. A quick trip to the vet showed that the dog had worms so bad it needed blood transfusions as well as multiple advanced deworming techniques. Normally, this is where the story would stop. A typical response would be for the couple to bring back the puppy to the breeder and demand their money back, as well as the vet fee spent to find out that the dog was on death's door. They made the emotional decision to try and get the dog the treatments it needed to get healthy. Fast forward through the emotional roller coaster of the touch and go medical treatments, and $4,000 later, they had Brownie back to the bouncy, overactive puppy they expected to have when they first walked into the breeder. The one element of the story, the one that resonated the most with me, was that the cost was so crushing that Amy put together a GoFundMe page for the puppy's vet bills she received over $1,300 in donations from others. Normally, I would lose my shit at what I considered to be such incomparably immature and entitled behavior. In effect, making a poor choice and then doubling down on it by asking people to support their clearly poor choice. Unfortunately, I can't because I did exactly the same thing myself. Well, mostly the same thing. It was when I was just married in the years before children. 
We had a pug dog. Lady was her name. We didn't name her, but we loved the lady pug pun. We also had a Pekingese named Daisy. We were looking for a pug and wound up getting Lady only because we agreed to take Daisy. The former owners had them both and wanted them to stay together when they went to their new home. We had a good deal of healthy years with both Lady and Daisy, but then something happened. Lady seemed to be limping. She also started going to the bathroom in the house. Several expensive trips to the vet later, we learned that Lady had a spinal condition where the spine was slowly degenerating. The vet bills piled up and eventually she lost all of her mobility in the back half of her body. We solicited friends and family for help and ultimately wound up getting her a doggy wheelchair, which is a contraption with wheels that strap to her back half and let her pull herself around with her front paws. It didn't really work all that well, but it was something. Eventually, even that didn't work, and ultimately her quality of life got so bad we had to put her down. Shortly after that, it happened again, this time with Daisy. She started to get cloudy eyes. Once again, there were trips to the vet, which resulted in trips to the doggy eye specialist. Daisy had an ulcer in her cornea, which required special medicine, as well as multiple visits to the very expensive dog eye specialist that was well over an hour away from our home. I honestly don't recall if we solicited help for Daisy's vet bills, but considering our situation at the time, I wouldn't be surprised if we did reach out again, and most likely did get some assistance from friends and family, even if it was more indirect. So, was this concept of getting a pet before you are ready for it, can afford to care for it, and then getting so overwhelmed with bills that you wind up reaching out for others to help, Unique to just me, Joe, and Amy, or is it something many slash most couples do? Answering that question is the point of this article. Getting a pet in the early part of a relationship is a fairly common thing. I know multiple people who got into a relationship, got a pet, and then broke up. Once they moved into the new relationship, they got a new pet. Usually a dog, but sometimes a cat. The species of the pet isn't as important. All of this together makes me wonder if it's a normal part of life, part of the early cycle of relationships. Date, move in together, get a pet. If you are not of strong financial means, as most young people aren't, then when life happens to your pet, you have to scramble for help. In one instance, the pet relationship cycle is like a new step in the old relationship cycle. In the days of my grandparents and prior, you would date, get engaged, get married, move in together, have a child or two, and then get a pet. Today, the pet's role has changed. It's a trial child. Well, the whole relationship chain has changed. It's swipe, text, screw, date, achieve the move in together status symbol, and then get a pet. Human children and marriage come into the plan next, but the order on when these last two happen depends on the couple. This almost makes sense. Almost. By putting the pet before the deeper commitments such as home ownership, there is less risk of lifelong impact. Relationship issues and general life screw-ups don't impact a pet like they do a child. Dogs and cats, thankfully, don't have the same psyche. On the other side of the is-it-stupid quandary is the question of cost. If you spend a moment and really think about that period in our life, When we are young, with limited financial resources, there are much better alternatives we can choose for said resources. Right off the top of my head, I can think of retirement, rainy day savings, debt reduction, housing, transportation, and many others. I guess retirement was the first thing that came to my mind because it's what I'm closest to at this point in my life. I know that the bigger the seed is when you are young, the exponentially larger amount you'll have later. It also sets up a good habit of saving for retirement that will follow you throughout your career. The rainy day fund is another huge issue. If you think about Joe and Amy's situation, as well as my own from back in the day, the huge vet bills wouldn't have been much of an issue if we had money in the bank. Sure, we wouldn't want to spend it on the dog, and that would be frustrating, but we wouldn't have had to throw ourselves on the mercy of loved ones or strangers who have a thing for throwing money at emotional GoFundMes. The list continues on. In some ways, debt reduction is more pressing of an issue than ever for the current day young adults. 
they are typically dealing with massive student loan debts that will burden them until they completely meet the debt obligation. The more you can throw at the debt, the better. Housing, especially in the current market, has become a big affordability issue for young couples, and cars have always been expensive. Unfortunately, when we are in our early 20s, we don't think about being strategic with an eye to the long term when we consider our financial resources. Usually, most of us aren't logical yet. In our early 20s, we live in the moment. The cute puppy, even at $1,200 to the breeder, will always win over the extra 5% of our income into the retirement account or student loan. So I think I have come to the conclusion that having the pet with the boyfriend or girlfriend is now part of the relationship cycle. It's a social construct that exists for the dating years. Now that I'm married, the role of the family pet has changed. In my current situation, I won't do a multi-thousand dollar vet bill. Even though I have a strong affinity for certain AKC breeds, I won't buy a dog for asking price. I got my current dog on clearance. I call him my refurbished dog. Technically, he was rehomed when the original owners couldn't keep him and returned him to the breeder. There was a rehoming fee, which was about one-sixth of what it cost when you got the new puppy. I love my dog, but I also know that once he gets really sick, to the tune of thousands of dollars, it's lights out. I say this because, as I've already explained, I've been through the pet life cycle. I know that even if you pay the crazy bills, there is no guarantee how long the pet will remain with us. Is it six months? Maybe it's an extra year, if you're lucky. I'm not anti-pet. If I was, I wouldn't have one. I think they really have a role to play with kids, with families, for mental health, and in many other places and at many other times in our lives. As an example, you see pets add value to people's lives well after the kids leave the nest and pets once again become the child surrogates. Fortunately, at this phase, the pet owners usually have the resources to care for the pets, no matter how expensive the bills get. Still, thinking back to all of the experiences of Joe and Amy, of myself, and others I've witnessed, I think the pet life cycle is unavoidable. It's now part of growing up and getting into a serious relationship. For the new couple, it adds complexity, it adds risk, and there's always the shame of having to ask for help when you get in over your head. But even with all this, it's still better than making the mistake with a child. I'll admit there's one silver lining to the stress of having to spend thousands of dollars on vet bills for your new puppy and all that goes with it. You'll still get to enjoy all those stinky puppy breath kisses, which are definitely one of the best ways to forget about all of those stresses in life. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Peluso Presents podcast. You can follow the Peluso Presents efforts via Twitter, at Peluso Presents, on Facebook, on Medium.com, just search for Mike Peluso, on LinkedIn, and of course, on the blog located at www.pelusopresents.com. You can email us directly via Peluso at Outlook.com. This podcast is available on all major podcast services, including iTunes, Google Play Music, or your podcast service of choice. We love and appreciate any comments and reviews you wish to leave. Please remember to support this effort by sharing and liking the postings on all your social media. If you'd like to support this effort more directly, you can via patreon.com forward slash Palooza Presents. Thank you for listening, following, sharing, and for your support. We appreciate it.